Duras Racing's future is very uncertain, and Shane Van Gisbergen is hoping to be full-time at the Cup Series in 2025. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight on those really quickly. We're going to start and talk about Spire Motorsports. As it was reported on Friday that Spire Motorsports will be sponsoring Carson Marshall Racing for the whole 2024 season. Carson Marshall Racing has been involved in the world of open wheel for a very, very long time. This is a really huge deal for Spire Motorsports to sponsor them. Obviously, I think that they've had association in the past with Carson Marshall, but it's really cool to see it. They're going to be sponsoring them in 2024. Glad to see Spire Motorsports expanding their portfolio. Maybe in the future we'll see them join the Open Wheel Series. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brad Keselowski. There's a very couple interesting facts that came out after Brad Keselowski won the NASCAR Cup Series race earlier today at Darlington. First, this is the first win for the six car since 2011 when David Reagan won at Daytona National Speedway. And this is the first non-restrictor play win for the six car since when Mark Martin won at Kansas back in, I believe, October of 2005. The other big fact... This is the first win as a driver owner since 2016 at Sonoma when Tony Stewart won his 49th and final career cup series victory. This is a big win for Brad Kozlowski. It's huge for the team. He's been close to winning many times, and it's really awesome and exciting to see that Brad Kozlowski is able to get it done and get that six back to victory lane. Congratulations to Brad Kozlowski on accomplishing this feat. It is really awesome for him. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Voyager. As it was poured by Adam Stern on Friday that Landon Castle is going to be required to pay $25,000 for being involved in the Voyager scandal. Obviously, Voyager was this cryptocurrency that sponsored Landon Castle pretty much for the whole entire season. But he didn't get to even finish the whole year. I think he actually finished the season, but Voyager was no longer working with the team because Voyager, once again, was kind of a scam crypto company. And therefore, multiple employees and multiple athletes who are part of the Voyager stuff kind of came into play. And that's why Landon Castle has to pay around $25,000, which could be a lot worse. $25,000 isn't as bad as I think some are considering, but $25,000 is what Landon Castle is going to be required to pay. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Busch. As Kyle Busch, of course, raced in the Truck Series race on Friday evening, and he scored his first ever last place finish in Truck Series history at Darlington Raceway, which is a long, because the other two times he's had finished last place in Trucks in Xfinity were back in 2003 and 2004 when Kyle Busch was 18 and 19 years old. Kyle Busch struggled in the Truck Series race, only completed two laps, tried to continue going in the Truck Series race, and unless people had failed post-race inspection, he was going to finish last, which of course, like I said, he ended up doing. Tough freight for Kyle Busch overall. He's been really strong in trucks this year, but he had never ran at Darlington, and they did get it all a little bit on track time. He was very fast in practice. I thought he was going to get the pole. Nonetheless, disappointing for Kyle Busch, but it doesn't shock or surprise you to see him struggle a little bit. He will probably, I don't think he's going to get any more truck starts this year, so nonetheless, it sucks to see him not back behind the wheel, and he gets a last place finish in his final run this year in trucks. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the IndyCar Grand Prix from Indianapolis, the San Cielo Grand Prix. As Alex Plo put up a pretty dominating clinic and picked up his first points paying IndyCar victory of 2024 and also his 10th career IndyCar win as well. He did have to earn his win at the end because Luca Giotto unfortunately spun out and basically got to get restarted by the IndyCar team. And then, of course, obviously, early in the race, Christian Lungard dominated. But Alex Plo, like how good of a driver he is, he was able to strategize and get his first win of the year. And you look how strong he's been in the month of May. We think Alex Poe has a good chance and opportunity to win the Indy 500 this year. He's had, had probably the fastest car in the last two Indy 500s, but it's unfortunately been some major mistakes have taken him out of contention to win it. Still, congratulations to Alex Poe on picking up the win. It's a pretty big victory for him. Congratulations once again to him on picking up his first points paying win in his 10th career IndyCar win. Congratulations to him on getting it done. It's a pretty big and massive accomplishment for him. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Shane Van Gisbergen. And now we're going to talk about Shane Van Gisbergen at the end of the episode. We did a video talking about this yesterday. And Shane Van Gisbergen, at his first trip to Darlington Raceway, he finished in 15th position. For a driver that had no practice and qualifying, because remember, practice qualifying got rained out, to finish 15th and get better as the race progresses is absolutely huge. 
We obviously know the SVG is looking to go full-time in the Cup Series in 2025. And he does have some races coming up in the Cup Series. Remember, he's going to run the Coco 600 in a couple weeks. He's also got some road courses coming up at Sonoma, Chicago Street Course, and, of course, Portland. He's going to be a threat there. Still, it's a huge deal for SVG to finish inside the top 15. And I think coming up, he's going to be a major threat as some of these tracks going forward. Nonetheless, once again, congratulations to him on picking up a top 15 in his first trip to Darlington. Really awesome stuff. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Drivers Only broadcast. As the Drivers Only broadcast for the next Xfinity race at Charlotte has been officially unveiled. So the people that are going to be in the booth are Joey Logano, who will be the play-by-play -play commentator, Ryan Blaney, and Eric Jones will also join the Fox Sports booth for Charlotte. In the pit road, you'll have Carson Hosovar, who's been doing some commentary recently, Fox, and Josh Berry for the first time will be with the Drivers Only broadcast. For the studio, it is going to be Brad Kozlowski, a veteran of the Drivers Only broadcast, and Austin Sendrick as well. I think this is a really solid lineup for the Drivers Only broadcast. I'm really looking forward to it. Joe Logano, I think, is going to do an excellent job. I wish that Logano and Kozlowski were in there, because I think Kozlowski would do a really good job leading it, but I think he's going to do a good job in the Shannon Spake position. It's really awesome stuff and exciting, and I'm really looking forward to the Drivers Only broadcast, because to me, it is definitely one of my favorite parts of the weekend is the driver's only broadcast. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Michael McDowell. Now remember, it was announced earlier this week that Michael McDowell will be leaving Fowler Motorsports at the end of the season and joining Spire Motorsports in 2025. Now he also confirmed a couple days ago that he's going to run some truck series races with Spire Motorsports in 2025, but the reason he left Front Row to go to Spire is because he wanted a multi-year deal. Now, he is not going to have a role in figuring out who will be taking over for him in 2025. There's obvious reasons for that because of the rumors of Stuart Haas racing. But when I look at Michael McDowell, I think it's a very lateral move. But I think for his family's sake, this is a great move for him because he's going to get more funding and he's going to get a lot of help going forward. I'm really happy for his future. I'm glad to see he's joining Spire Motorsports next year, and I think he'll do a solid job. I think he is going to make that program a lot better next year, as I think Michael Medell always gets the best out of it. I think he'll do a really good job next year. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the DEI trademarks. Now, if you've been paying attention on social media, Jory Terratamella, Ter who basically has been following the whole DEI trademarks and also Breakheart on YouTube has been following the story as well. The number one trademark has been officially renewed through 2031 and the number A1 has not been renewed and has to be renewed by the start of June, which they apparently have not been filing for that, which is really, really huge. The number 15 trademark that Teresa Earnhardt has owned has gone to Michael Waltrip. He's using it for the brewing company, and I don't expect the number 8 one to be renewed. I don't know why the one's been renewed. I have a feeling it's because Ty Norris and her really don't, didn't like each other, and I think she's holding a grudge over him at the moment. Breakheart did a much better job explaining this, but this absolutely is a huge story because the DEI trademark is officially gone, at least potentially with the A car, but the one car is going to stick around. She has to prove that she's selling merch, to my understanding, which I, well, she really hasn't been selling merch at this point. Nonetheless, when I see this kind of stuff, I really hope that Dale Earnhardt Jr. can pick up that eight trademark so we can start seeing some really cool stuff and some cool throwbacks in the future, especially for drivers like Kyle Busch and Dale Jr. as well. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Callum Isla. Now, if you saw on social media yesterday, you saw that Callum Isla is teasing some plans. Then he said he has to catch a flight to go to an unannounced race for this year. Now, he did say maybe NASCAR. And he might race in North Wilkesboro in the Truck Series or the Cup Series. But I don't think that's what it's going to be. I think it's going to be him announcing that he's going to be racing Indy 500. In fact, I think it's all Tony Donahue, who works for some pretty big media companies. He actually kind of confirmed that Callum Alla is going to be running in the Indy 500 once again this year in the number six car. Taylor Butcher is supposed to run a majority of the rest of the year, but because he has not passed his rookie test to run the Indy 500, Callum Alla will be taking over to six car. And Callum Alla was really solid in the Indy 500 last year of Hunkos Hollinger, and we know how strong... Or Aaron McLaren has been at the Indy 500 in the past. I wish it was a NASCAR ride, believe me, but honestly, him running the Indy 500, it's going to be really cool to see him do that. It's a great opportunity and chance for him, and I'm looking forward to seeing him more likely run in the Indy 500 with Aaron McLaren. I think he absolutely deserves a chance and opportunity to race in the Indy 500 because I think he'll do a really excellent job. 
And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Eric Amarola. As Eric Amarola confirmed in interviews after the Xfinity Series race yesterday that he'll be driving a 20 car for Joe Gibbs Racing at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Eric Amarola made his first start in a couple races where he finished inside the top five and he'll be going to a track where historically he's been solid at in the past. And Joe Gibbs Racing's been solid, though Junior Motorsports has been the team to beat. But I think if that 20 car has the same speed that it had at Las Vegas and Phoenix especially, I do think that Eric Amarill will be a threat for the win in the victory. The 20 car has been really fast this year. John Hunter's won a race this year. We saw Ryan Truex win a couple weeks ago at Dover. And we also, like I said, have seen Eric Amarill go to victory in that same car. Eric still has around five or six or seven or eight races still scheduled for the rest of the year. It's going to be fun and exciting, though, to see that he will be driving the 20 car once again as Charlotte. I think he's absolutely going to get the best of it. And I think he's going to do an excellent and great job next week or two weeks from now, I should say, at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Haley Deegan. Now, if you watched the NASCAR Xfinity Series race yesterday, you saw the Haley Deegan unfortunately crash out. And what Fox mentioned was, was that apparently she had a flat tire. Well, if you're on social media yesterday, she actually called out the Fox Sports broadcast, which is probably one of the first few times we've seen the Fox broadcast called out by drivers. She says that there was no replace for the wreck. Apparently, she got dumped by Patrick Emerling, who was a lap down, by the way, in the 07 car, and she got wrecked. Now, obviously, I saw some comments that were kind of negative toward her, unfortunately, but I think it's really interesting to see that a driver is calling out Fox Sports. And I think this is something that needs to be done a lot more commonly. Now, I will say the Xfinity Series broadcast was actually not completely awful, but I do think that they absolutely need to do better. And the replays are a big thing. The production at Fox has not been very, very good, and they need the change going forward. Otherwise, they're going to lose a lot of money. It really doesn't make any sense why they signed a seven-year deal, by the way, which actually, for luckily, the Xfinity Series is going to be moving over to CW, and I think the CW is going to take sport more seriously. In fact, they're going to get a chance and opportunity to have the CW here at the end of the season. So, though, it's very interesting to see, and I really appreciate Haley Deegan calling out Fox because Fox absolutely deserves to get called out because they keep making a lot of mistakes, and to me, it's just unacceptable to see that they keep making the mistakes that they end up making. They need to get better. We want them to get better, and they just really don't take the criticism. You said if you saw Jamie Little on social media, she really doesn't. It seems like they don't care about the criticism, which they need to be caring because we want them to get better, and we want to see improvement. I really hope they can improve soon because they absolutely need to show a lot more improvement in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Eric Amarola. As it was poured by Austin Kanensky from Motorsports Wire that Eric Amarola is expected to drive a 16 truck for a toy racing in their return to the truck series this week at North Wilkesboro. Eric Amarola has not raced in the truck series since he drove the five truck for Richie Waters Motorsports back all the way in 2012 at, I believe, Daytona International Speedway, or I believe finished inside the top 20 in that race. Eric Amaral obviously is focused fully on Xfinity and running part-time there, but it's really interesting that he's chosen to run at North Wilkesboro. But then again, North Wilkesboro is a fun and exciting track. But remember, they just had a repave at the track recently. Still, it's going to be very fun and exciting to see Eric Amaral back in a 16 truck at North Wilkesboro. It's been a long time since he's raced. I think he's going to do a very solid and excellent job behind the wheel. And it's just cool to see he gets a chance and opportunity to run in the truck series with a team that does bring a little funding and sponsorship to the table. Excited to see them back and glad to see the Eric Amarillo will be driving for Tory Racing this week at North Brooksboro. Really looking forward to it. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Auto Club Speedway. Now, Justin Scholler, who is a fellow Twitter reporter, he basically provided a little bit of an update on Auto Club Speedway. If we take a look at the image of surface that he put out, you can kind of see the track has had a little bit of an update, but they haven't really been building anything. We obviously know that there's a lot of talk that we're not going to be racing in Southern California in 2025, and it was confirmed about two or three months ago that we are not going to be racing at Auto Club in 2025. The earliest we could be racing at Auto Club Speedway is in 2026, but obviously the track still needs to get finally done, and some are saying it might not even be till 2027. 
It sucks to see the two-mile track going away, considering the racing on the intermediates has been absolutely incredible with the next-gen car. And I think the racing the last two years at the track in 2023 and 2022 have been absolutely excellent. So it sucks to see the track kind of going away, unfortunately, and turning into a short track. I hope by the time we go back to Auto Club that they've got the short track package completely fixed because they absolutely need to get it fixed. So the racing is really, really good. Nonetheless, it's interesting to see that what we're seeing from the photos and surfacing and stuff. I really hope they get the track built up soon because I love Auto Club Speedway. I wish they were having to do what they do. It sucks to see that they're doing this, but unfortunately, if they, we, fortunately, it kind of sucks. But sadly, it is what it is. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Todd Gillen. Now, Todd Gillen was speaking to reporters yesterday during media availabilities, and he says he's close to signing a deal with Front Row Motorsports. He also says he's looking to become the leader at Front Row Motorsports and Michael Medow going away. Todd Gillen has signed a one-year extension with Front Row, and he's been with Front Row the last couple of years, since 2022. And so far, Todd Gillen in 2024, in my opinion, has been doing a pretty excellent, a really good job with Front Row. To me, it would be a no-brainer to keep him around. And I think it's probably not going to be announced too far down the road because obviously we know there's a lot of rumors that SHR could be merging with Front Row or Front Row could be all together buying up SHR at the end of the year. I like Todd Gillen. He's shown improvement even today at Darlington. He was really, really fast and showed some pretty great progress and really good speed throughout the event. Ran top 10 in majority of the day, but I don't think he got the finish that he deserved. Still, I'm really encouraged by the speed the front row has been showing. It feels like the Fords are starting to be a little bit quicker, and I really think if Todd Gillen continues to drive for this team, I think he's going to continue doing great things. So excited to see Todd Gillen likely returning to front row. Obviously, the contract has to be signed, and usually with front row, they sign stuff a little later, but I think with the realm is going on, I think it's probably not going to be announced too far down the road. It sounds like Todd Gillen will be staying with front row long term, and he is close, in fact, to signing a deal with the organization and the team. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Martin Truex Jr. Now, Mark Truex Jr. spoke to multiple media members yesterday, including Bob Pockers, and he has confirmed that he hasn't talked about 2025 yet and whether or not he is going to be returning in 2025. But he did say that he needs to start working on that really, really soon. Every single year since around 2021 or 2022, we've always speculated that the season that we're in is the one he's going to retire. He announced in 2022 that he'd be coming back in 2023 in June of that year at Nashville. Then last year, he announced at Michigan that he'd be returning in 2024. It seems like it keeps getting later and later every year. And many are even speculating that Mark Trix Jr. may not make a decision until he gets around the playoffs at this point. And again, the fact he hasn't even talked about it at this point is definitely very interesting. Now, when I look at this situation... I think right now, more than likely, Mark Trix Jr. is going to retire at the end of the year. But to be fair, he is having a very good year. So what if he does decide to retire at the end of this year? Well, more than likely, Chandler Smith or Corey Heim is going to take over. And my bet is Chandler Smith. Chandler Smith is currently driving the number 2081 car, excuse me, for Joe Gibbs Racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Has already won two races so far. And he's currently the reserve driver for Toyota. I think Chandler Smith will be in the Cup Series next year, regardless whether it's 2311 Legacy or JGR, because I think that Chandler Smith is absolutely ready. He's doing a phenomenal and incredible job with JGR this year, and I think he'll be the likely replacement for Martin Truex Jr. I don't see anybody else taking over other than him. William Swatch is in no way, shape, or form ready, and then obviously I don't think Sheldon Creed is going to come in, though he could be in the Cup Series potentially next year. But I do think that if MTJ does retire at the end of this year, I do truly believe that it is going to be Chandler Smith taking over the ride at the end of this year because I think he's absolutely ready to move up and I think he'll do an excellent and great job. We'll see what ends up happening with the silly season because we always talk about Mark Trix Jr. every year, but it does sound like more than likely that Mark Trix Jr. could retire at the end of the year, but there's also a chance for his performance that he could stick around in 2025. Wait to see what happens and we'll see if Mark Trix Jr. does in fact decide to stick around in the 2025 season or if he does decide to go ahead and retire at the end of the year, which I think is absolutely and certainly possible going at the end of this season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chris Buescher. As after Brakazowski won the NASCAR Cup Series race the earlier today at Darlington, Brakazowski confirmed that Chris Buescher did in fact sign a multi-year contract extension with RFK Racing. Remember, this was actually a contract year for Chris Buescher at RFK. 
But because of how good he's been performing with RFK Racing over the course of the last couple of years, it makes a lot of sense to sign the extension. Now, how long was the contract extended? It is unclear at this point, but if you want my speculation, it's probably a two to three year deal. I would say he's probably got a contract through 2026 or 2027. That's the thing about NASCAR contracts, right? They're never really this close to the public, and you have to figure it out by going to inside sources whether or not or how to figure out how long the contract is. But it's a well-deserved contract extension because Chris Buescher, in my opinion, has been absolutely doing an amazing job with RFK Racing. He's in the top 15 in points currently at the moment. Last year, got three victories and made the round of eight, and he's very close to winning races because he's had the pace and speed to contend up front on a week-by-week -week basis. And I think he's going to continue doing that with RFK Racing over the next few years. And it wouldn't surprise or shock if how much RFK Racing has shown improvement in recent years. It doesn't wouldn't surprise or shock me if we do it do in fact go ahead and see them go out there and go to victory lane in the futures. I think he is going to win a racer before the end of the season with the speed and pace that he has been showing. He's had a couple runner-up finishes this year and had a chance to win the race today at Darlington. It makes a lot of sense. Obviously, there's a lot of talk that RFK could expand in 2025, maybe find a way to get Justin Hilly brought over for Rick Ware. But I think Rick Ware is going to want to keep him considering the fact that Rick or Racing today had really saw a performance where two of their cars were running inside the top 20 all day long. Great run for that team, and great to see if Chris Buescher is going to be sticking around for RFK Racing. He deserves the extension. They could go with someone else too, like a Haley Deegan, perhaps someone like in the four camp, like a Matt Benedetto in the future. But Chris Buescher, nonetheless, is going to stick around with RFK Racing in the future, and I think it's the right and a justifiable call to keep Chris Buescher long term. Because personally, in my opinion, Chris Buescher is an excellent talent and a very, very good driver, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Homestead Miami Speedway. Now, earlier this week, we talked about the possibility of the schedule getting released in 2000 for 2025 as early as this month. And Jordan Bianchi noticed something this weekend about Homestead Miami Speedway. Now, according to Jordan Bianchi, it does sound like that Homestead Miami Speedway will not be hosting the season finale, a spot where we had heard a couple weeks after the race at Phoenix or during the Phoenix weekend. We had heard there was a chance that Homestead could host season finale in 2025, but it sounds like 2025 could be the last year for Phoenix host season finale. Because according to Jordan Bianchi, during the City of Homestead Council meeting on April 17th, city officials agreed to prepare a bid to return to, for the season finale in 2026. And according to some reports have been speculating, apparently they are looking to do some renovations here in the knots too far down the road and make some big upgrades to Homestead Miami Speedway. I do agree 100% of a lot of people are saying, Homestead Miami Speedway absolutely deserves to be the season finale. It always provides excellent and great racing. Look, I understand Phoenix is a really solid and good market, not just for TV, but of course, for people to go to the track. The track always sells out. That's why they're going to be getting the season finale once again as well. But I'm going to be real and honest. I'm, no, I'm just saying it's about Phoenix in general. Phoenix Racer, regardless of what type of car or track, the track just does not generally provide excellent and great racing on a consistent basis. And I don't think that Phoenix is going to do that long term. I understand that they are a really good market, and they bring a lot of funding in as well. Again, they've got those massive, massive renovations, which is a big reason why they've kept the season finale for as long as they have. But personally, I think that we need to move on from Homestead Miami Speedway and go, not Homestead, excuse me, from Phoenix, and go to Homestead. Homestead is a fantastic track. It deserves to be the season finale going forward, and I really hope they make the right, in, in right decision for 2026, and Homestead is the season finale. Like I said, the schedule is expected to be released sometime this month, potentially. I would imagine maybe around the Coco 600 weekend, which, by the way, is only about two weeks away. We might also potentially be getting some schedule releases by the time you're watching this. So we'll see what happens on that front. But looking at the potential schedule release, it could be happening this month. But unfortunately, Homestead Miami Speedway will not be the season finale in 2025, but could potentially be it in 2026. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Blaney versus William Byron. So going to the restart on lap 130 of the race, William Byron was sending three wide to the bottom of the racetrack. This would cause Mark Truex Jr. to get a little loose over Ryan Blaney and would then send Ryan Blaney into the outside wall. We saw the radio communication between Ryan Blaney. He said he was very pissed off at Mark Truex Jr. and William Byron. Now, William Byron and Ryan Blaney do have a little bit of history in the past, but today it kind of spiraled a little bit out of control in a sense. And then 
But after getting out of the infield care center, after I believe it was Jamie Little who showed the replay to Ryan Blaney, Ryan Blaney once again was very mad about the situation. He said that William Byron should not have sent it three wide going into the corner. I agree with Ryan Blaney 100%. I think William Byron, as much as I respect how talented he is, he was way over aggressive right there. There's no reason a lap 130 or 131 of the race to be that over aggressive. And I completely understand why Ryan Blaney was frustrated at William Byron for this because Ryan Blaney understandably wasn't at, was he, which he was having a pretty good day overall. But it's been a struggle for the Fords for the most part, though I did mention earlier that the Ford, Fords were able to go to Vichy Lane with Brad Keselowski. But Ryan Blaney has ever had to be frustrated and upset. Now, is this going to spiral in the next few weeks? Well, could, because remember, we're going to North Wilkesboro next week, and it is a short track. Now, William Byron also did speak to the media after the race had happened. He also kind of said he needs to see the replay for what happened there. To me, like I said, it was William Byron's fault. He sent it three wide. I don't know why Blaney was mad at Truex. Truex, Truex was really not at fault. In fact, Mark Truex Jr. was actually trying to back out of the situation, so I can't really blame Mark Truex Jr. for that situation. To me, in my personal opinion, I'm putting more blame on William Byron. Byron needs to know a little better, especially that early in the race. I get you're trying to get as many positions as possible because it's very difficult to pass today. But at the same token, same time, you've got to be very, very patient. You can't be over aggressive. So to me, like I said, it is in my, no doubt in my opinion that it's William Byron's fault. I think he was way too over aggressive and I think he went too far to try to make that move. In my honest opinion, it cost Ryan Blaney a good day and he was unpositioned to get potentially a top five or ten. That being Ryan Blaney. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about manufacturers. Now, Tyler Head was a Darlington race. He was a fellow media reporter, and he actually showed a photo, a potential fourth manufacturer that could be coming into NASCAR. Now, from what Bob Poggers actually showed, that this kind of is like a show car that they were testing. But I don't completely think it is. I think this could be a little bit of a teaser of a potential fourth manufacturer that could be coming in. Now, why do I say that? We've been paying attention over the last week or so. It was reported by Adam Cern that NASCAR is in talks and conversations with Honda and Hyundai potentially of joining the sport. But they have stated that the, the only way they would come into NASCAR is if they didn't run a push rod V8 engine, but they could run different engine configurations. The earliest we could see a manufacturer in a sport is 2026. And the big key thing for them is they need to see hybrids come into sport. Otherwise, they are not going to join. According to Adam Cern, it sounds like the earliest we could be getting hybrids is 2026. When I look at this image, I look at a couple different manufacturers. I see an Acura, maybe the NSX. This could be a Honda. This could be a Hyundai. This also could be a Cadillac, considering the fact that the Camaro is no longer going to be around and the Malibu got discontinued this past week. I wonder if they're in talks to bring a new manufacturer in for Chevrolet as well. And this could be something that could be done in some of these secret wind tunnel tests that have been going on recently. So, to me, it's really interesting to see. I do think we are going to get a new manufacturer in the sport in the next couple of years. I think the fact that Honda is looking to leave IndyCar, I think Honda for sure is the most likely to come into this sport. But I also think Hyundai, <coughs> them being in talks and Ed Lock is saying that this week, I think it's very likely that we could also see Hyundai join the sport as well. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in regards to that. I really hope we do get to see some new manufacturers in the sport. I think most likely it's going to be Honda Hyundai, but I'll throw Cadillac in there as a potential placement for Chevrolet in the next couple of years. I think it could happen in the next few seasons. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Corey Heim. As it was officially confirmed on Friday that Corey Heim will be driving a 50 for 2311 Racing and National Super Speedway. This will be the second start of three starts scheduled for the number 50 car. Remember, Kamu Kobayashi drove the 50 car as Circuit of the Americas, where unfortunately he had some major issues and problems, and I believe finished outside of top 30 due to getting in a couple instances with Josh Berry and, of course, Ricky Senhouse Jr. We thought maybe there would be somebody else behind a wheel like a Carl Lewis coming out of retirement, maybe Kurt Busch coming out of retirement, considering a few months ago, Kurt Busch had teased maybe a return to the sport. But Corey Heim was absolutely the most logical, right? In the video that surfaced on Thursday, it was teased that this was a driver that was a big fan of Denny Hamlin. Obviously, Corey Heim is a massive and huge fan for Denny Hamlin. And the other big key reason why he's getting the chance and opportunity, remember, it was announced, I believe, in January and February that Corey Heim was a reserve driver for 2311 Racing. Remember, he's also a reserve driver for Legacy Motor Club. Of course, took part in as substitute for Eric Jones the last couple of weeks. So Eric Jones, of course, did make his turn this past week at Darlington, where I believe 
believe he finished around 20th in the race, which is not that bad for a driver that's been out in the last couple of weeks. Corey Heim, there's a lot of hype around him, and it's justifiable. He was very impressive in the two races that he ran. He had a top 20, I think he had two top 25 performances in those races. And I do think that Corey Heim is going to be a threat and contender, not for the win, but I think with how fast 20 to 11 racing has shown their pace and speed, I do think that Corey Heim is going to be very, very, very competitive at Nashville because I think 20 through 11, especially Tyler Reddick as well, he was very good. And he's also going to have some experience because I think he might be running the Xfinity Series race and he is for sure running the Truck Series race during that weekend. It's a fantastic, great opportunity for Corey Heim. I would love to see maybe like Carl Evers come out of retirement and drive the 50 car. I'd also love to see Kurt Busch, maybe if he can get medically clear, maybe come back as well, or Chandler Smith, or maybe Sheldon Creed or Eric Armour will get the chance. But I think Corey Heim is absolutely a justifiable choice. He's a very talented driver. He's done a great job in the truck series. He did a really good job in the select starts that he ran last year, earlier this year, I should say, with them. And I think he'll do a really good job with 2311. I think he will at least get a top 20 when we go to Nashville later this year. I think he'll do an excellent and great job at Nashville Super Speedway. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Daniel Suarez. Now, silly season is starting to heat up. And Daniel Suarez has asked questions regarding silly season if they are close to getting an extension done with them. Here's what Suarez said. He says they are working on a contract extension at Trackhouse Racing. They can't reveal exactly all the information in regards to the contract, but they say they are getting close to announcing an extension. Now, why is this a big deal? Remember... It was announced that Michael McDowell would be joining Spire Motorsports in 2024, driving the number 71 car. Who currently drives the 71 car? Uh, Spire Motorsports. Zane Smith. But remember, Zane Smith is on loan from Trackhouse Racing over at Spire Motorsports. And many are expecting that we are going to see Zane Smith in a full-time Trackhouse Racing car in 2025. In fact, it's already been rumored and reported that the 16 charter the Call Racing has from the NASCAR nostalgia page on Instagram, it's been reported that that charter has already been sold to track us because Call and track us do have a pretty big partnership currently at the moment, which is why I think that charter has been sold. And Daniel Suarez does have that win. We know he's in a contract here with Tracos. He did get that win in Atlanta, but I think his future is still very clearly uncertain at the moment right now, especially with Shane Van Gisbergen, who we're going to talk about near the end of this episode. But Daniel Suarez needs to step up the plate. Yes, he did get that win in Atlanta, and he's had a couple solid and good performances this year, but for the most part, along with Tracos racing all together, they have struggled quite a bit this year. And when you have a lot of younger drivers in the wings like Shane Van Gisbergen, who is older than Daniel Suarez, but also Zane Smith and Connor Zilich as well, who's got a long-term deal with Trackhouse Racing, you're going to have a lot of pressure on yourself to really step up and perform. To me, I do think that Daniel Suarez will get extended with Trackhouse for one or two more years, but I think he's going to be on the hot seat because Daniel Suarez is going to be in his mid-30s. We know Trackhouse really likes Daniel Suarez. He's done a really good job with that team. He does have two wins with the organization at this point, but we've seen Ross just saying get four wins, and he's been close to winning a few races in recent seasons as well. I do think for sure that Daniel Suarez will get an extension done with the team, and I think he 100% is going to stick around with Trackhouse Racing for many years to come. Because he's a great talent, in my opinion. Well, he's not a fantastic talent, but I think he's a solid driver overall. He, the Trackhouse family, and it, it fits really well with the organization. And I think he will get an extension. He did release a video earlier tonight that he apologizes for the bad performances. I think Trackhouse has been down to performance and speed. So I think that they will look to get better and show a lot of improvement. But to me, I think that Daniel Swartz is a good driver. I really hope he can show improvement going forward and get better as the season goes on this year because he really needs to step up to the plate, especially with him being on the hot seat. And his future still at this point, despite the fact that he looks to sign another extension, his future still, unfortunately, at this moment is sadly a little bit uncertain. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Harrison Burton. Now, it was poor by Oskanensky from the Motorsports Wire, which is, of course, associated with USA Today. He reports that Harrison Burton is unlikely to return to the Wood Brothers in 2025. This also comes off from an article from Bob Pockers earlier this week in regards to the state of silly season. This does not shock or surprise me that Harrison Burton's future is very uncertain at the team. 
And he did say earlier this year at Daytona that this was a make or break year for him if he was going to return to the Woodbriars in 2025. And so far, Harrison Burton has absolutely struggled. I believe he's 32nd or 33rd in points, which, by the way, is second worst, I think, in all of drivers that are running full-time this year. And he's actually really close to Kaz Grahl, who's already missed a race or two so far this season, which is a shame because I think Kaz Grahl should be full-time, by the way, with them. But Harrison Burton, man, is just not cutting it. He had that one really good year in the Xfinity Series, rear form very well. In fact, there was a stat that came out, I think, from NASCAR fan 4AAJJ, who's a fellow YouTuber, who basically put out a stat showing the comparison stats. And when you look at the comparison of performance, Harrison Burton has finished 27th, 31st, and is 33rd in the points. Matt Benedetto, the previous driver of the 21 car, finished 13th and 18th, and he had a lot of top 10s, had 20 top 10 finishes in the 21. So far in the three years that Harrison Burton's been behind the wheel, which is more races, he has only had five top 10 finishes and one top five finish. To me, that's unacceptable. I know Penske's been struggling a bit, but they have not done a very good job. But obviously, we know Matt Benedetto did have a falling out with the Wood Brothers and Penske especially, which is why he lost his seat. Now, who do I think is going to take the 21 car next year if Harrison Burton goes? I think this could be a place for Riley Herbst. Riley Hurts might be going to the front row as well, but there's a chance he go to the 21. He brings sponsorship in funding, and there's no disrespect. I think that Riley Hurts is a better driver than Harrison Burton, and I think he'd do a better job in that 21 car. I could see someone outside the box like a Brett Moffitt if he can bring sponsorship and funding to the table. Brett Moffitt would do a good job. I could see Cole Custer going there. Cole Custer's future is uncertain, especially with the unknowns of SHR currently at the moment, and there's other drivers in the four camp that could go there in the next couple of years. And also, if any of those rumors of SHR don't happen and they do downsize and they stay around next year, I could see maybe Ryan Priest going there. Ryan Priest, I think, would do a much better job in the 21 car, and he does have a little bit of sponsorship funding because the Wood Brothers are going to need sponsorship and funding to stick around long term. To me, I think this will be figured out in the not so distant future, but I'm not surprised or shocked that it's very unlikely at this point that Harrison Burton is going to be staying with the Wood Brothers. To me, I just think that they need to make this move. He hasn't really done anything of the team. This was a make or break year for him, and he hasn't shown the improvement that I think a lot of us are absolutely looking for. He needs to do better. I haven't seen the improvement, and I do not expect him to be back at the Wood Brothers next year, especially with the rumblings going on. I think he'll likely be going either back in Xfinity or I could see him going to TV. He just hasn't shown the improvement, and there's no disrespect. I'm being blunt about it. I don't think he'll be back next year because I think he's just not done a good job, and he has absolutely struggled up to this point so far this year. And now we're going to hedge up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chris Buescher versus Tyler Reddick. Now, if you watched an NASCAR Cup Series race earlier today, you saw the feud that was started between Chris Buescher and Tyler Reddick. Coming to around 10 laps to go in the Cup Series race at Darlington, Tyler Reddick had the faster car and was running down Chris Buescher because Chris Buescher, for whatever reason, was starting to run a lower line going down the back straightaway. And Tyler Reddick got a really great and big run going into turn number three. Then they made contact going to three after Tyler Reddick attempted a slide job, kind of like what Kyle Larson did to Kyle Busch back in 2018. And there was contact, and unfortunately, both of them got into the outside wall, and this would hand the win to Brad Keselowski. After the race concluded, Chris Buescher justifiably was very unhappy with Tyler Reddick and went over and confronted him, and not only just went to talk to him, he actually went and grabbed him. They both eventually kind of broke up a little bit about after that happened, and basically they spoke, and Tyler Reddick did take responsibility for the wreck in the incident, and he said that it was my fault. I said it. I don't want to race you like that. I don't want to wreck you like that, and justifiably, Chris Buescher was upset. Now, Chris Buescher did say, speaking to Bob Pockers, that he did appreciate Tyler Reddick taking responsibility for the wreck in the incident, but he also said that Tyler Reddick should know a lot better, especially with the caliber of driver he is. Tyler Reddick also spoke to the media. He said he definitely effed up and he accepts responsibility for what happened and, and that Chris Buescher was absolutely right for everything he said. Look, I think Chris Buescher has every right to be upset and frustrated with Tyler Reddick. I think it was a little bit of a bonehead move on Tyler Reddick's part to make the move that he made. He unfortunately cost both of them a shot at the victory and handed the win to Brad Kozlowski, which at least for Buescher, that is his teammate and his owner that got the victory. But Chris Buescher also have to keep in mind also lost in a photo finish last week at Kansas. So that's not the only thing with the, what happened at Darlington. He came close to winning. He was asked so many questions by the media this week about that finish, which absolutely frustrated him. 
And then you add on top of this as well, where Busher and Reddick had the contact. I don't blame Busher for being upset and frustrated. I want to see that fire from a driver. Because that kind of fire from a driver like Chris Busher could absolutely lead him to going out there and performing extremely well and going out there and looking for victories. We want to see him go out there and win. And he's had the pace and speed recently. The Fords have shown more pace and speed. But at the same time, on the other side, Tyler Reddick, in my opinion, I love the maturity here where he's taking accountability and responsibility here. He could have fought back and punched Chris Busher, but he didn't. He held himself back, and he took accountability for it. That's the most important thing. Now, could we see these two feud next week or, or this week in North Wilkesboro? Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. But I, what I appreciate is the fact that eventually they talked it out, and it sounds like hopefully things will be calmed down going forward. But at the same token, same time, like I said, I get Chris Buescher being upset and frustrated. He had a shot to win the race. He was in position to get it done. He had gotten by Redick and Kozlowski after both those drivers had contact, which, by the way, there's no feud between both those guys. And again, I think what I will, like I said, appreciate Tyler Reddick for is taking accountability for what happened on the racetrack. When you're a driver, you're supposed to take responsibility if you make a mistake. And I think he did make a pretty big mistake getting into Chris Buescher. But at the same token, in the same time, I do appreciate Chris Buescher for not killing him at this point and basically effing him up and basically not having really anything else after that. Will we see more from this? This probably will be a big talking point this week for sure. But to me, I think there's no doubt in my mind that Tyler Reddick was at fault. But they're also going for the win, so you're going to see that aggression come up many, many times. Nonetheless, really interesting stuff, and it's interesting to see if Chris Buescher was upset, but I 100% get and understand completely the frustration by Chris Buescher after the incident and the wreck. I think it was justified that he was upset about what happened. And now we're going ahead, jump on to the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about Shane Van Gisbergen. Now, we talk about Shane Van Gisbergen's very impressive performance at Darlington Raceway and doing the honoring of Marcus Ambrose. But before the race weekend even started, Shane Van Gisbergen spoke to the media and was asked questions about his potential future running full-time in the Cup Series in 2025. Well, Shane Van Gisbergen says that he is hoping to be full-time in the Cup Series in 2025 with Trackhouse Racing. But he does note and say that it will depend on his performance in the Xfinity Series and the Select Cup Series races in 2025. And four, I should say. And if he continues to improve on a week-by-week basis, there will be a good chance he'll move up in 2025. Shane Van Gisbergen, in my opinion, has been doing a very solid and good job with Trackhouse Racing in and not Trackhouse and College Racing in 2024. So far, Shane Van Gisbergen, I believe, only has three finishes outside of the top 20 this season. And those three finishes outside of the top 20 were running out of gas at Talladega and not making up ground. Coda, where he absolutely should have won that race and finished 27th or 28th because he got a 30-second penalty. And then at Las Vegas, where unfortunately he had an engine failure early in the race. Every other race he ran so far, he has finished inside the top 20 for the most part. Now, usually he doesn't start the races up front, but he usually makes his way forward outside of the road courses. But this past week at Darlington was a perfect example of him showing improvement. He started back in 19th. Fell back a little bit, but on the long run especially, he started moving forward and got himself a top 15 finish. That is the most important thing. And you look at where he's at at the points right now. He is 20, only 27 points below the cutoff line in 15th. To me, that is very impressive. And we got a really great stretch of races that are coming up for Shane Van Gisbergen. He's obviously got Sonoma coming up. He did a wheel force test this past week. He has also got some other races coming up at, you know, Portland. Of course, he's got Chicago. And I think he could be a threat at Charlotte as well because he's going to get some Cup Series experience as well. Remember, he's got some Cup Series races scheduled coming up at Charlotte and also the Chicago Street Course. To me, he's been showing so much improvement. And I absolutely do believe, because he does have sponsorship from Red Bull and WeatherTech and Quadlock and the other companies that work with him, like Wendy's, I think he will be full-time in the Cup Series in 2025, depending on his performance. Now, where will he drive? More than likely, it's going to be with Trackhouse Racing. But they're going to need a charter for Shane Van Gisbergen. Because in my opinion, to get in a full-time Cup ride, you need the funding. To me, if I was looking at Zane Smith and SVG, I'd go with Shane Van Gisbergen. This is no disrespect to Zane Smith, 
But I think Shane Van Gisbergen is a better driver than Zane Smith. Though, yes, Zane Smith is a Truck Series champion, and he is a very good driver. There's no denying that. I just think that Shane Van Gisbergen would be a better driver to go with. But also, Zane does bring a lot of funding, and Zane's under contract for multiple years with Trackhouse Racing. So, obviously, he's going to be brought in. More than likely, that 16 charter is going to go there. Now, there is a chance and possibly that we could see Trackhouse get a charter from multiple organizations. Spire, which are going to be a three-car team, so that's not going to be on the table. But what about a team like Colic Racing, right? Colic Racing, I could see their Cup Series program being absorbed to where Shane Van Gisbergen is with a fourth Trackhouse car. Or there is a chance and possibility that we could see SVG go to one of the Colic Racing cars and take over maybe the 31 car to become a one-car team. Daniel Hammer, no disrespect, has been struggling for the most part. Yes, he did get a couple top 10s recently with Call of Racing. But if I'm Call of Racing, I'm looking toward the future. I would definitely look at Shane Van Gisberg and being full-time with us as well. But again, I do think that SVG is going to be a full-time cup driver. So I think by the end of the year, he won't only be competing for wins on road courses, but I think he will absolutely be competing for wins on ovals, especially if Call of Racing stuff gets better. Because let's be real honest, too. Call Racing's NASCAR Xfinity Series program has absolutely been struggling and they have not been performing. Josh Williams, who I expect to be a borderline playoff contender, is sitting like 21st or 22nd of points. He's kind of in the same area as Haley Deegan in the points right now, which is really, really concerning. So to me, I think that he'll be full-time cup next year. I think you're going to see four trackhouse cars next year. I can see him getting a charter from Sewer Haas Racing as well. But to me, I think they are going to be an organization with four full-time entries. In my prediction rounds, I think that SVG will be in a fourth trackhouse car with the number 97. I think it's going to happen. I think he will move up to cup full-time next year because I think he's got the talent and capabilities. He's been showing improvement. And the big key thing is sponsorship. Again, it all comes out of the charter agreement, which we know Justin Mark spoke about that earlier this past week and was really happy on kind of where the negotiations were going despite other people like Michael Jordan and Denny Hamill saying they weren't going very well. I think that Shane Van Gisbergen will be a full-time cup driver in 2025. And now we're going ahead, Javon, to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Stuart Haas Racing. We have talked a lot about Stuart Haas Racing on the channel over the course of the last couple of weeks. They are a big team around the silly season. Early in the silly season, we had heard they might sell one charter. Why? Well, they're no longer going to be a key four team in 2025. We also had heard that they could potentially move to a different manufacturer in 2025, maybe to Chevy. But it sounds like they might be sticking with Ford for the 2025 season. Now, Josh Berry was asked questions this past week by the media about whether or not he's heard anything from the front office or people at the higher-ups at Stuart Haas Racing, whether or not Stuart Haas Racing could be making moves. He said he hasn't heard anything at this current moment. There's also rumors that Stuart Haas Racing could potentially be merging with Front Row Motorsports where they would basically be a four-car team next year, where there could be a couple drivers on the market, or the team could potentially be Todd Gillen, Josh Berry, potentially Chase Briscoe, and Noah Gregson, but also you could throw in Cole Custer and Riley Hurts as possibilities as well. But the other big rumor that was started in the last week or so is that Stuart Haas Racing could be shutting their whole entire program down at the end of this year, which absolutely is massively shocking. Stuart Haas Racing has had a lot of success throughout their time as an organization and team. They just won the Xfinity Series Championship with Cole Custer last year when Cole Custer crossed the finish line at Phoenix. And they've won two Cup Series Championships, once with Tony Stewart in 2011 and once in 2014 with Kevin Harvick. But all that success in Cup came when they were a Chevrolet organization. Since getting the Ford, they have lost a lot of big things. Kurt Busch left to go to Chip Ganassi. That 41 car struggled for the most part ever since. They lost Kevin Harvick this year as Kevin is our reserve driver for Hendrick Motorsports doing some stuff at the All-Star Race. And then, of course, you have Kevin Harvick working there. And he also lost Eric Amarola. And you also had an opportunity to get Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch, even Zane Smith and Michael McDowell. And that is not going to happen. They also, like I said, lost a lot of funding. And with them being no longer a Tier 1 team, and there was also rumors that Tony Stewart and Gene Haas are really no longer interested at this point in owning charters and working at SHR at the moment, that is why a lot of rumors are that Stuart Haas Racing could be shutting down. I think the fact that there's a lot of validity to these rumors and the fact there's a lot of talk about it, I think there is a good chance that SHR shuts down or sells some charters. The least likely possibility is Stuart Haas Racing doesn't do anything. They are going to do stuff. The next least likely thing is them only selling one charter. 
I think that the, these are three big key scenarios that are going to happen at SHR. One, they are going to sell these two charters this year. I think that is definitely something that will happen for sure. With them no longer being a key one, key four team going forward, I think they sell a charter to a team like 2311 Racing. 2311 Racing is looking to expand next year, and they've got a lot of drivers on tap that could take over like a Chandler Smith and even a Corey Heim. You've also got Legacy Motor Club that's looking to expand potentially next year. They're rumored to be potentially expanding. You've also got, of course, Junior Motorsports is interested in moving up next year. They could go get someone like a Kyle Weatherman or move someone back like Casey Kane or move up Connor Zillich perhaps next year. Then you've also got RFK Racing. They're looking to expand. Their brand is Sage 60 car back, and they're looking to be a three-car team next year. You've got Haley Deegan in the pipeline, Riley Hurts, Cole Custer, those people that are in the pipeline for RFK Racing going into next year. The next big possibility is a merger with Front Row Motorsports. This is a big rumor that's been circulating is that a merger could be happening. Front Row wants to expand. It's no secret, but they also unshare. And it, Jerry Fries said there's not a lot of smoke. There's a lot of smoke, but not a lot of substance to the rumors, which is kind of interesting considering that Tony Stewart is basically nicknamed Smoke. So a lot of rumors that Front Row could be expanding to a three or four car organization to merger. But then, like I said, you go back to the shutdown rumors. I think there's a lot of validity to the shutdown rumors because they could be selling their whole operation and building. We know Front Row is looking to expand and they would be loving, loving to take all their drivers from SHR over there. I think for sure Ryan Priest is going to be gone, but I think Ryan Priest likely goes over to the Wood Brothers next year and takes over the number 21 car. I think there's a lot of big movement that's going to happen this silly season. A lot of chaos is going to happen, and everything is circulating around Stuart Haas Racing. I think everything's also circulating around what is going to happen with this big charter agreement going forward because no one really knows what is going to happen to the charter agreement going into next year. We've got a lot of drivers and teams going like 2311. You got Bubba Wallace over there who's still doing a good job. Obviously, some people think he probably should be out of ride at this point, which I don't think he should be considering he's around in the playoffs at the moment. But I do truly believe that there is going to be some big movement going on from Stuart Haas Racing. And like I mentioned and said, I do think there's a lot of validity and truth to the big rumors going around around SHR. I do think that they are going to make some moves here soon. And some are speculating that these moves could happen in the coming weeks. I do think, again, if SHR doesn't have a cup program or Xfinity program next year, it's going to be a great shame, man, because Stuart Haas Racing's had a lot of success, but also they've been fading off. But to be fair, this year, they've shown improvement. Noah Grayson's done a great job this year. He's in the top 20 points, I believe. Josh Berry just had a fantastic run at Darlington, finishing third. Chase Briscoe got a top five, and he's in the playoffs right now. And then, of course, you have Ryan Priest, who for sure is likely out. There's a lot of teammate drama around Super Haas Racing. And Ryan Priest, in my opinion, is no doubt going to be out. The question to me is what happens to the rest of the drivers at the organization. That is a massive and key question going forward. But like I said, I do think, unfortunately, Stu Ross Racing is in jeopardy and their future is very uncertain as they could be seizing assets and seizing operations at the end of the year, which would be a massive, unfortunate situation. But I think there's a good chance that it could happen at the end of the year because it's unknown if the team is going to be around in 2025, unfortunately. So that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. If notifications on so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Let us discuss below that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think Suras Racing is going to be around next year or not? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about the future of Shane Van Gisbergen? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Tomorrow on the channel, there's a chance of possibly there could be another silly season update of all the chaos and drama going on. There also could be a lot of other MIG videos coming out as we get close to North Wilkesboro. We're also going to have Truck Series race picks in the next couple days, and we'll have a lot of great content dropping really, really soon. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.